you need to find what you love and rebel against it. And uh, that I, I really love that. And, uh, you know, what? And it would mean like find what you love and rebel against it. Yeah. So wow. and I think um, it, it relates to, you know, like there's these ideas like Carol Bloom talks about the anxiety of influence. And he talks about like strong reading and misreading of, of previous poets. That's how poets. But I think Steinitz was saying the same thing. It's like, I, listen, if I love Robert Adams, which I do, or Gothic, OK, cool. But now say what? what is in me that needs to do better not and it's not really better but what 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 about that work still doesn't satisfy me what would what is it, what do i have to do to make it mine you know like and so then you kind of grab onto so i can say well it's a perceptual model but but i'm not going to you know gossage is sort of somewhat famous for going you know using fairly narrow depth of field for example or using those extreme close-ups and you know like that's not of course that's not the bulk of his work but you know people know him for that so that's like something you just that's a that's a tactic that you don't want to use. You want to adopt strategies and not tactics, I guess, Just, you know, like to use that sort of language. So uh, that is genius. Welcome to the show, Tim. Thanks very much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I've loved Urbanautica for a long time. It's been kind of an important part of the conversation. Uh, love having the Italian influence on Americans to keep us honest, because we can kind of think that we're the center of the world for photography. So total, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and um, Steve Bisson has been such like a key part of uh, like a, many wonderful things, the activities, the photographic stuff I've done in Europe. Uh, so it's a uh, delight to be here with you guys. And um, yeah, I'm like, Happy to happy to share the time. Before we get started, go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience yep. and, and kind of talk about a little bit of your background, where you come from, and how you got involved in image making as a whole. For sure. Yeah. And so I'll flip it over to the PowerPoint. We'll start right there. That's cool. <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so as Patrick said, my name is Tim Carpenter. I live in Brooklyn, uh, New York um, and New York State. Uh, but I also uh, I spend a lot of time in Illinois, uh, which is the state where I'm from. And I'll just show you uh, for people who aren't quite as familiar, uh, the little red dots were right there. That's um, where Brooklyn is uh, in comparison to New York City. Uh, and then where you see the, the big map in the United States, that's Illinois. And then the county I'm from is called Piatt County. It's the red county there right in the middle kind of in the middle of the state. It's about uh, two hours south of Chicago. So um, if anybody knows where Chicago is. That can kind of orient you. But um, the reason that I say that is that it's important to me because um, all of my cameras, all of my film are in Illinois. They stay there uh, and they are at my parents' place. And that's it's really relevant to me because my dad is a lifelong photographer and um, he is very interested in trains and, and um, locomotives and train modeling and stuff and part a big part of that is photography of course and so he's had cameras forever he my sister and i he gave us uh point and shoots and you know just about as much film as we needed or wanted uh as kids so i was always into photography and um it's become a big part of my practice to, to spend time spend a significant amount of time in illinois there um, almost everything i'm going to show you today uh, all the books i've made uh, with only one exception, all those photographs were made in Illinois. Uh, it's a very that's pretty wild. Right? Yeah, uh, that's pretty wild. That's why uh, I was like, you know, I've I've seen in some of your interviews that you you spent uh, some time and lived in 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 Oregon and and now New York yeah. and but most of your work comes from the countryside in Illinois, and so I uh, I was looking through a lot of your work and I was but you leave your cameras there. It's just easier, you know, because, well, and they're also big, you know, I use a four by five, you know, try five and oh, thing. Wow. So, yeah. And so I just have the, the film is all sent there. My, my dad, they're really generous because my mom, my, there's an extra refrigerator down in the basement. So that, you know, that's got beer and film in it and, uh, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> that all there. beer and film, uh, my kind of guy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's the kind of thing, you know, that's all I need to live. So, um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just made it easier because when I'm in New York, I can kind of do my thing and make my living. But when I'm in Illinois, I'm really focused on, you know, working uh, with the camera with, a, you know, two cameras. And uh, so that's been really amenable to me. So I spend, you know, three to four week periods there several times a year. 
and it's good just hang out with family you know like i'm there for a long time so if it rains a few days i don't you know i'm, I'm not upset because i've got plenty of time or if family events come up i've got plenty of time and so it's just a, it's a been a really good way for me to work uh been very relaxing and you know the other thing is is this part of the country is not very remarkable for like scenery i mean it's beautiful but there's no mountains there's no ocean so you know it kind of flat it kind of keeps you calm and playing <laughs> you know you're not really seduced by um by big you know grandeur or anything like that which you know for is good for me because i'm seduced by uh i guess smaller things in general so uh anyway that's a little background to let you know where what where i'm kind of working it's a, it's a pattern i've established now for 10 or 12 years and i really love it i plan to keep doing it you know for the for any the foreseeable future um but the, the before we go into like actually talking about some some projects and stuff which we can talk about over a while I, there's a couple things I that uh, I especially talk to this talk to students about this or um, people who are you know maybe just starting out, um, but it's uh, it really influences what I would say to you over the next hour or so you know about anything. Um, there's two kind of shifts I want to talk about that happened around grad school. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple slides. These are the pictures that got me into grad school. Um, I was making very classic American road trip you know uh photographs and um you know very much in the like of stephen shore joel sternfeld people like that um and you know i was i liked them i i um you know i was working hard at it and i was getting into some shows that was was helping me out and these are the pictures that also got me into grad school uh but you can see you know like whether you want to call it homage or sort of more like ripoff you know like i was working in the language um of other people, you know, of my predecessors. And uh, it's even so more so, sure. yeah. yeah. And even more so, I saw so I was, you know, making portraits, but, you know, again, I just wasn't, you know, I was making stuff that I liked, but eh, you know, this is at the time, like certainly, you know, the Sternfeld portraits and, and then Alex Soth, you know, was such an important figure at this time. And yeah. uh, I, you know, it got to the point where I was, I was sort of just like, well, you know, I just stopped the camera down to four or five, six, and then, you know, you pop the, pop the, uh, the figure and then let the ground fade a little and then boom, you know, you got this great portrait and certainly that does work. Um, but you know, I wasn't, I wasn't really zoning in on what Alec was doing, you know, that was important or what, uh, you know, other people like working like that were doing. And so, you know, I'm, so the first thing to say is that, you know, I, I, I was using sort of other people's, you know, approach and and kind of filling that out and so i didn't really feel like it was mine the other thing uh, and i'll show you as we shift into this next slide is that so i would go on a trip maybe around the west or maybe even just to illinois and you know i'd come back with 70 80 rolls 100 rolls and 50 sheets you know four by five and when i got it you know back and i was developing i would you know in my head i would say to myself boy i hope this picture of that guy worked out i hope this picture of that old motel worked out because yes. and, and that's because my head was so subject matter driven. Yeah. Like I was I was really searching subject matter and I realized that that was maybe a problem. Uh, you know, that's the, that was the wrong way for me to work. And so as I went through graduate school, uh, this changed. And I'll show you this next slide. This is this is just a sampling from my graduate work. And, you know, this didn't happen overnight, but over the course of a couple of years, I would bring back 80 rolls, uh, you know, 50 sheets or whatever. And I would not have any idea what was on there other than some trees, some roads, structures. The other shift I want is, you know, I'm a photo book guy. And, you know, coming from a classic kind of American tradition of the photo book. And um, so, you know, I think a lot about photos in this structure and and how how they work and what they mean and and all that kind of stuff but i within that i just want to show you the, the most important book to me uh is this one uh a book called the pond by john gossage and um the, the the real thing for me is like before this you know i would look at the people i revere like lang evans um you know robert frank and and um you know, uh, Helen Levitt, like all of these ones, like I, these books and these photographs, they were, I've started, you know, understand my understanding is they relate to certain sort of topics in the world they, and, and they help you learn about topics. So they help, they help you understand topics. So for example, it, especially because they're American, this, these, a lot of these were, you know, post-war, post-depression, 
So there was some politics there. They're, they 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 deal with race politics. Um, they deal with economic, you know, stratification, socioeconomic things. Uh, they deal with car culture, for example. They deal with advertising culture, which was taking, you know, both of these things were sort of taking over the United States at the time. So there was like, you know, issues. I mean, things to talk about, sort of like, you know, now in theoretic language, you say that these sort of sort of semiotic concerns, which is great, you know. But then I get a hold of this book, and and I you go through it and. There is nothing you are going to learn, that nothing you need to know about trees and water and some roads and nothing you're going to learn coming out of it. Coming, you know, This book is about pure experience. Uh, and this was a big shift for me. Uh, it's not unrelated to the shift that I just told you in making my own pictures. You can probably make that you know, parallel. But I was just kind of you know, thinking about, uh, and I think this will inform what Patrick what we're going to talk about later too, is like my move yeah. away from sort of linguistic meanings in photographs and, and much more to sort of a perceptual model, which, um, you know, in, in some ways I mean to defy language by doing this. And I think a book like uh, like this by Gossage sort of does that uh, where I'm getting it was it sort of works outside of language and sort of a different register. So that became really interesting to me. And that really informed a lot of what I've done. Uh, you you had mentioned uh, it, John Gossage in, a, in an interview before. Did you find yourself like adopting that aesthetic in, in your work where you, or you, um, did you find yourself mimicking a little bit or did you kind of find your own aesthetic when you started to work? Yeah, no, listen, you know, like in the same way I was telling you that I was mimicking Alex, so for example, or Stephen Shore, yeah. I wanted not to do that again, you know? And so, <laughs> you know, like, I, right, I mean, I think, but, you know, like, no, it's a perfectly good question. And I think, you know, and also I was still in MFA, you know, like this is still the time when you're asking yourself those questions yeah. and, and wanting to be hard on yourself. And so, no, like, what, and then I was like, well, what do I need to do is I need to find the essence of what's going on. You know, like, and there was, this, I got to tell you, there was this one brilliant thing that, um, so out of many brilliant things that Mark Steinmetz said to us, because we, my final review committee was Ron Jude and Mark Steinmetz, which was fantastic. Wow. So Steinmetz at one point, and it wasn't my review, it was in one of my, my um, classmates, but he said, well, if you need to find what you love and rebel against it. And uh, that, I, I really love that. And, uh, you know, I, and it would mean like, find what you love and rebel against it. Yeah. So, wow. and I think um, it, it relates to, you know, like there's these ideas, like Carol Bloom talks about the anxiety of influence and he talks about like strong reading and misreading of, of previous poets. That's how poets, but I think Steinitz was saying the same thing. It's like, I listen, if I love Robert Adams, which I do, or Gossage, okay, cool. But now say, what, what is in me that needs to do better? Not, and it's not really better, but what, what, what about that work still doesn't satisfy me? What would, what is it, what do I have to do to make it mine? You know, like, and so then you kind of grab onto, so I can say, well, it's a perceptual model, but, but I'm not going to, you know, Gossage is sort of somewhat famous for going, you know, using fairly narrow depth of field, for example, or using those extreme close-ups and, you know, like that's not, of course, that's not the bulk of his work, but, you know, people know him for that. So that's like something you just, that's a, that's a tactic that you don't want to use. You want to adopt strategies and not tactics, I guess, you know, like to use that sort of language. So uh, that is genius. Uh, and that is so true. Uh, if you don't want to look like somebody else or, and, and I know a lot of us, you know, especially, uh, I, I got my MFA as well in photography and, mm-hmm. and, and, uh, you, you, I think you're first, when you first start, you, you do mimic a lot, you do a lot of mm-hmm. the same approaches, but then all of a sudden you, you just kind of have to break out of that. And, and what you just said right there was, was kind of that, the key to that, uh, break that open for me a little bit, Ex- explain yeah. that a little bit more. Well, yeah, and I will tell you, because it just reminded me, because my, my friend Raymond Meeks, he, he said when students say, you know, well, I, I, I just want to make this kind of picture, he's like, go ahead and try, because you can't, first of all. <laughs> so, like, if you want to be Andrea Modica, like, yeah, try, uh, because you can't succeed, because you can't be anyone else, but, like, sure, knock yourself out, you know, like, and it's kind of actually fun, and it's liberating to just say I'm doing this. But, but again, what I think, you know, is, like, what I learned is that you're trying to not unpack and I'll back up just a second because I, so many times I do a talk and, and, and a younger person will say, what kind of camera do you use? And I, and I always say, I will answer this question, but I, can I redirect you to something else, which should be more interesting to you? And I think will be more helpful to you, you know, and then I'll eventually tell them what kind of camera this is, you know, and <laughs> as I was getting at the tactics are, you know, 
a certain like a certain kind of camera like in america that that mamiya became very popular because of its aspect ratio and because of its lens yeah. and, and all that you know and like it became popular in a different way for street photography for example yeah you know so so it's not knowing the camera and knowing you know just to knock it down to f4 you know hit it hit the hit the portrait subject but it's thinking about well why is Alex Soth or Sternfeld or some or anyone, why are they isolating that figure in that ground? Are they doing three quarter shots? Are they doing full bot? You know, like what re- it's like, let's now let's talk about the relationship of the maker to the world and to the world they're photographing. And like, what are they doing to distance themselves or to become close to that? And that's like, that's getting interesting to the gist of it. Um, you know, like I'll work with a student. And they'll say, I'm so interested in this place and in these people. And I'm like, great. Why did you, why did you pop them out from their background? If you're so interested in the place, why did you blur the place? And they're like, oh yeah. And I'm like, but you know, you know, you got to get to the gist of what you're doing is like, well, maybe it'd be interesting to shoot it at F11 and knit the person to their background and see what happens then. Because you know, that's the gist of what I want to get more interested in, like my relation to the world. And um, so that, and that's something I will talk about in like how I make pictures. So it's like, Right. It's, you know, like it's not saying, well, this guy or this woman uses this kind of machine and and does this, you know, like and so I can copy those pictures. It's like, well, Andrea Modica breaks my heart with this book, Treadwell. I want to try to get under that and figure out why the heartbreak and then figure out how I can, you know, like what would that would be for me? You know, like something like I that. think that's wonderful. It's it's like you're um, um, and and this is uh, this is when I actually changed uh, taking photographs too was uh I wasn't chasing a subject. I was chasing a feeling. And it's one of the reasons why um, I really liked uh, your work is I, I feel like you're a, um, not chasing. A, and you said it in, a, in, in an interview that you did. You're not you're not chasing a memory per se. You're not trying to recreate a memory. You're trying to chase the feeling of that memory. And that's why you're going back to that same place, it seems like. Um, and so uh, and leave your cameras there. And I, I think that is a. Uh, an interesting strategy and not a tactic. You know what I mean? Right. I think that is right. Uh, I love uh, love what you say there. Um, just to stay on uh, the early days of you and, and where you came from, was there uh, an interesting person that came into your world that that taught you something and, and brought uh, kind of took you under their wing? Uh, uh, anybody like that that stood out to you, or or were you kind of one of those people that uh, found your inspiration in books? No, there was a really important guy, and his name is Terry Totemeyer. Uh, not well known, not as well known as he should be. But so I was, I had moved to Portland, Oregon to go to law school, believe it or not, passed the bar in Oregon, but kind of quickly got into doing some marketing work for a legal firm. And I only tell you this really quickly because it led me to doing marketing work for the Portland Art Museum, which is one of the great regional art museums in the United States, Portland, Oregon. And, um, there, so I got to work a lot with the curators, which was wonderful because I was writing the newsletter. And there's and Terry Totemeyer was the curator of photography at the time. Uh, and it, this was so long ago; it wasn't even a fully funded position, so it was like a part time position at a major museum. But like, so I showed him a few pictures I was making, and he was so nice, really kind. And he's like, I, "Listen, I think you know you would love to see. We've got some Robert Adams in our collection." And he had some Shores and Sternfeld, um, also for like they were some of them were made in Pacific Northwest. They had that regional sort of interest for them. But he also owned like Cindy Sherman, like he owned some other, you know, and he, they owned a few Wintergrands and some stuff like this. And so suddenly I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, he's showing me all this. And like, so this new world is opening up for me. Um, so his kindness and sort of his, you know, patience with seeing my really bad early pictures, you know, but knowing, but seeing maybe where I might want to go uh, was really important. The other guy I just have to mention though is Robert Lyons, who um, he, founded the graduate program that I went to um, at the Hartford Art School. Um, it was a, it's a limited residency MFA. And I met him. Um, it was like a two weekend course at the International Center of Photography here in New York. It was, it was about personal vision. You know, it wasn't like technique or anything like our printing. But we got to be we hit it off pretty well. And he saw the kind of pictures I was making by then. And he said, you know, I'm in a few years, I'm going to be launching this MFA. And I think you might be really interested in it. But at that time, like I was like I had a management position in like the, the kind of work I did, which was entirely outside of photography. And I was like, you know, I was getting near 40 and I was like, there's no way I'm going back to school. You know, it just seemed ridiculous. And, but you know, I'd get a call from him every month or six weeks and he'd be like, Hey, guess what? I added Doug Dubois 
added Alex so you know Mary Fry is on that and I was like I love you know I worship Mary Fry and so one day I woke up and I looked at the ceiling I know and I was like if I don't do this I'm gonna regret it every day of my life you know like I, I have to do this and I so his persistence and um <laughs> was super important to me and then you know he the, the, the graduate program that he crafted uh if, if not for robert you know like i'm not sitting here talking to you that's for for damn sure so um wow so yeah so that was really important um but so those are the those are the two that really you know like you know above and beyond the call of duty they kind of <laughs> pushed me so uh i know there's a lot of people that uh they're they question whether they should do art school or what have you because you know mm-hmm. You can learn so much technique and stuff like that on YouTube these days. It's yes. and uh, uh, for me, I found so much benefit from it. And uh, you had mentioned some of that, um, and uh, I keep referencing interviews. If you haven't gone to urbanautica.com and checked out uh, some of the interviews and, and some of the blogs that he does, Steve does, you should. Um, but he he one of his interviews is on a project we're going to look at here in a in a few minutes. But um, you you were talking about that influence of the art school and 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 how it was helpful to you. Can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Uh, uh, yeah, I I found a lot of benefit in it. But what what did you find there? So there was two things. You know, I think the one is that everybody would expect from from graduate school is to well be, have time pressure and peer pressure. You know, and you know, like to yeah. to work and get better. Okay, so that's normal. The thing is, like, so in particular in this part in the in the Hartford is that because it's a limited residency, you have your summers at Hartford and it has great facilities, but the, the summer and fall class, or sorry, the fall and spring classes move around to the important photography cities in the world. So of course, like New York, uh, Berlin, um, San Fran, um, you know, and just, and, and moving around. And uh, now I think that there's classes in Tokyo right now, actually the, the, the students right now, but what you do there is not only meet photographers, but you mean galleries, curators, painters uh you know other people working in this and so the other important part for me was seeing a lot of people who were finding different ways to make a life in this work right so it wasn't like you had to be super famous and have a gallery because that would you know that was kind of what i thought like it's like well it's either it's either or you got to make your money somewhere else or you're going you know you got to be really famous <laughs> Yeah, And I didn't, I knew I didn't, I wasn't really going to an MFA to teach. I have to say that too. It was not that kind of thing. I, 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 so, but to see like, okay, so Justine Curland has us over to her place, which is, you know, it's on the Lower East Side. She, all the photography stuff is by her bed is by, you know, like everything. And, and you realize people, they learn to live in different ways to make what they did, what they want to do have happen, you know, and then you see people who, you know, maybe they're a combination of teaching, publishing, working in other things. And so suddenly you get to see, oh, there's a bunch of different ways to, to crack this nut. You know, like if you really want it, you can figure it out. And so that, yeah. that was the, probably just as important for me as making the pictures better was figuring out. It's like when I went back, you know, it's like I graduated. It's like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure something out because I don't want to give, I don't want to give this up. You know, I can't give this up. So, um, yeah. so that was a big deal for me. I think that's a, that's a very good insight. I, you know, when I was, uh, uh, when I was in art school, one of the things that I really enjoyed was the critiques, you know, mm-hmm. it was uh, the same people seeing your work over and over and over again. And uh, I take it, I always tried to uh, compare it to sharpening a knife. You know, you kind of one pass, second pass each time you get sharper and sharper and sharper. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and that's that's how I felt with it. And it was one of those great experiences that uh, just makes you a better image maker and it helps you understand Uh what um uh what you're doing um was there a was there go ahead well i was maybe you're about to set me up for this because uh i you know i'm going to tell you a quick moment uh and was the first summer when we you know we bring in the stuff that got us there and so you know it would recall those slides i showed you would be those first couple color slides right so i show all that yeah and you know everybody's like cool good you know like and doug dubois goes so what do you think of it and I think part of me, I thought, well, like, you know, it was brand new. You know, like I thought I could be a little self deprecating or something. And I could say, well, I think, you know, even at his best, it's a little bit derivative. And he took a second. He goes, you're right. And I was like, you know, uh, I, I was like, but like it was, I think it was the the thing that I needed, like, you know, the little stab that uh, I needed to be like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to put that life behind and I'm going to, you know, now it's something new. Uh, 
but it took about yeah. somebody like I loved and respected that much to be that kind of brutally honest with me. So uh, it, it was good. It was, you know, it's a little heartbreaking, but then in the long run, it was great. So, uh, so I'm going to take you out of art school for a second. We've kind of found out your roots uh, a little bit and kind of uh, start taking you into your projects. Um, right. And uh, I kind of want to know, um, when did you, because sometimes, you know, you know, a lot of artists, you know, we kind of work, in, I think, in like a vacuum, like we we're self-inspired. We we kind of want to make a project and we just go for it. Um, what was that moment for you? And what was like your first project that the kind of flipped the switch for you to be um, a maker? Um, there's always that moment, I think, you know, after you get out of uh, school, you those are project based. You have to deliver, you have to have a deadline and you're and you're trying to get a grade, you're trying to graduate. But after that, there's nothing pushing you. And so uh, what pulled you into making images? What inspired you? Yeah, well, you know, I'm going to not quite answer your question for a second to get somewhere. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to, but I'm going to bridge a little bit. You're going to work around into, me. Yeah. Okay. You know, I'm a good politician, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, but easy, but easy. I, <laughs> I think it gets to the gist of the question um, yeah. because it bridges grad school into post. Uh, and that was so uh, just a little moment about what I was working on. The uh, the pictures you saw, the black and white pictures, they were made because they uh, I was looking at an abandoned rail line, railroad line that uh, my dad had only even as a kid, he'd only been on it once or twice as a passenger because then it became a uh, you know like a freight line and then it disappeared. Uh, it was, you know, abandoned. And so I was very interested in this and I was I, I was sort of doing it, though, in a, in a historical way. And I was very I was, you know, I was working with the, the um, historical society on it and I wanted it to be very true. And, you know, I was, I, but I was wrapping myself in circles around and finally, like towards the end of grad school, uh, one of my good friends, Nelson Chan, he's like, he's like, you, this is not photojournalism. This is not reportage. This is you. And you, and, and it was like, you know, it was just one of those things I needed somebody to like say. And so like, I, and now I, you know, I don't think any of my projects are, you know, information about the world. They're, they're information about how I meet the world. And so when I was able to flip that over and kind of like I relaxed and I started adding some pictures that maybe weren't exactly on the right rail line or something like that, that was because now I owned it and it wasn't, it wasn't some external thing that owned it. And so this was a really important thing that kind of parallels all the other things I was talking about. But like, once I got out of grad school, like, I was like, I own this now. This is, and again, this is part this also parallels what I was telling you. I, I need to form my life around this because I I became a different person who wanted to own image making with a camera like very specifically I wanted to move through the world with this machine figure out plot myself against the world and figure this out and so you know then I and little, one little detail I should have said about the Hartford program it's a book oriented program so you graduate you do a show at the end you know just because you do uh, but you're you are you know you you're judged on or, you know, you're graded on the book that you produce. So like, and as I mentioned, I'm a, I'm a book guy. So that's always where my head was. And so, you know, like I came, I, you know, like I had some friends come out of grad school and just paralyzed. <laughs> you know, really did not want to do anything for a while. I came out guns a blazing. I got to tell you, I was just like, you know, I was just ready, you know, and I was, I was making tons of pictures. I, you know, like it, it was fire hose, you know, like I just, and I just had to figure out how, how to get that energy together. But like, you know, now I had a community and so, like, I, par partly to answer your, community, your, your question, though, is, like, I had a community now, uh, not only my MFA friends, but also, there's, you know, there's a bunch of photography people in New York. So, like, you know, and now I could, if I'm starting to work on something in shape that I had a group I could work with, you know, so I wasn't so much in isolation. Uh, you know, I was going off and doing my thing. But then when I, you know, came up with something interesting, now I had some some voices or or some, you know, some people to uh to you know bounce it off of and see where it was going so that kind of like that shifted into now i had this structure where i could do this practice the other and the other thing just to to finish that little bit of the story off is that with a few of my buddies including uh nelson who i just mentioned but carl woolley um i started um a book called a book company called tas book uh so that's the publishing thing you were you were mentioning and um i'm no longer part of the business i'm still like best friends with them and i still do some writing for them and everything but um 
I just, I learned my life was, I had too busy to be a publisher anymore, but uh, I still really love it. And it was, it was a great experience to kind of get from the other side of this to be, you know, to work with artists like Steve Smith, uh, like Justine Curlin, like John Gossage and, and go through that process with them. So like, I was just book guy, you know, this, and I knew that's what I wanted to do. And now I had the structure to work on book type projects and start to bring them to, you know, some sort of fruition. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, I want to lead you into uh, a project that uh, I think was, uh, I know when I was uh, doing a little bit of research and when I first saw you was local objects. Do you want to take a look sure. at that really quick with me? Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. that would be a yeah. fun one. Cause uh, now we get to kind of look at um, your aesthetic, your, your, the way you frame things, the way you look at the world, I think was really, really interesting. I found a lot of the, um, uh, uh, I keep referencing myself, but as a photographer, you 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 flip through a lot of images, you know, in your own mind and, and through your own frame and, and when you start to do your own edit. And uh, I, I felt uh, a lot in common with you, um, partly due to the fact is, is I, I couldn't help but notice the lack of people in these images. Right. And so let's uh, let's uh, talk through that a little bit. If sure. you're willing to share some and, and talk through I some, am. I think that would be a really fun project. So uh, let's take a look at that. Uh, kind of give me the the background on the project mm -hmm. um, and kind of talk through some images with us. I think it's this is this will be fun. Great. Yeah. So this is my first monograph. Uh, it's with um, the publisher is called The Ice Plant, and that is Trisha Gabriel and Mike Slack, who are in Los Angeles. Um, but, uh, you know, to go back. So this is this is probably, you know, at the end of tail end of grad school and uh, then in the time after grad school is when I was making these pictures. And, um, you know, Sometimes, and I've, I, now that I work a lot with students, I'm like, do not be afraid to say the dumbest things about your pictures because it really helped me. <laughs> like, and all I got to tell you is the dumbest thing was that I was learning that, especially with, this was all that Mamiya handheld, right? That six, seven. If you resolutely keep your camera, when you're, if you're shooting vertically, if you do not raise your camera at all, you're going to get a lot of foreground, you know, and that's true with, and especially with like any two to three aspect ratio, but this one. What I, you know, I was making a bunch of photographs that uh, I had a lot of dead space in the front of them, and I just kept doing it, and I, I was grappling with it, and I said, well, this is weird, but I was like, well, I'm doing it. So, and that sort of, I'll tell you, that sort of idea has, has now permeated everything I do, is that I'm trying to learn from the pictures I make and not try to resist them, at least at first. Um, so, anyway, that's a, that's a little bit of over talk to be, so, tell you so, that. Okay, okay, talk to Go me ahead. about that. Yeah. Yeah. learn from the images that you make what are you learning yeah so i'm i use this metaphor now and are you there i've never been in analysis but what i understand from talk therapy is that you talk a lot somebody else kind of look you know listens and says here's what i hear you saying this model sounds really interesting to me because what i do is i make tons of photographs and you know i just i do you know i i am not scared of wasting film and what I need to do then is later to kind of say, why am I making a certain kind of picture? Why are my edges this way? Why is there this much distance? You know, and these are all formal things. One could also say, well, why am I, uh, uh, you know, taking pictures of roads or, you know, so you could also kind of ask yourself subject matter. You can ask yourself all these questions. And I think at some point you kind of got to be, you got to yank yourself out of yourself and be, try to be objective about your subjectivity you know, um, if that makes any sense, but like really look hard on, on the distance, you know, you're placing yourself in your world because my whole thing about photography now is that it's a, the camera is a machine that, especially if it's handheld, it is stuck with you as you move through the world. And even if you move on a tripod or whatever, that's moving with you through the world and you are placing yourself in a certain relationship to the things of the world. And that tells us about what you are and who you are as a photographer as a maker. So if you're making a lot of distant photographs, I think you got to think about that, you know, and if you're making a lot of closed up, you got to think about that. And like I said, for me, this, this, this process was then saying, I'm making a lot of pictures with mostly dead space in them with, with, without getting too heavily metaphorical on yourself. I was feeling like I was feeling a certain distance from the world that I, I needed to think about. So, and that did not happen in horizontal pictures. Okay. So then again, this is where we talk, we're just talking very, you know, plain, easy to understand terms that doesn't happen. And, but it needed vertical pictures. And so um, for anyone who hasn't seen this and 
Um, I will say also for anyone who's going to hear the audio version of this, all of these pictures that we're going to discuss today are on my website and we'll give you the address at the end. So if, you, if you'd like to see the pictures, you, they're all there. But um, what ended up for local objects is that this is a book entirely of vertical pictures um, because that's what I, you know, one day decided that it had to be. So, um, so anyway, we're looking right now at the cover, um, which is just a picture of a kind of a divided field uh, with some corn. It's a very simple picture. I have to tell you the moment the ice plant showed me the first choice for the cover and they picked that picture, I was uh, kind of shocked because I thought it was not, I loved the picture, but I didn't think it was a cover picture. And then like a minute later, I, re I just, I was like, I was so happy that they trusted that picture enough. So that was, that was a really cool thing, uh, just as a little kind of publishing note. But I'll, I'll move through the book a little bit here. Um, it's pretty simple pictures. Well, you know, maybe we'll just go, I don't know, five or eight or ten pictures deep. Into yeah, it, let's but, pick a few uh, of them that you think are important. Yeah, to, so yeah, uh, as far as the uh, standout to you that really speak to your aesthetic, I think you have a very interesting visual language uh, for sure. And one of the things I did notice was the open spaces, but I also noticed geometry. I, I noticed yeah. uh, uh, you exploring your eye and 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 the the frame a little bit and yeah. and lining it up. And so I, I thought you had a very interesting um, aesthetic. And so pick out a few that you, that you like, and then I'm going to ask you the metaphors. So, okay. Uh, I want to know, I, I want to get deep with you. I don't want to just talk technique here. Okay. Oh yeah. No, te uh, you will rarely hear me talk technique other than you know, <laughs> where technique, but, but listen, I mean, also I, I should say, I, I, I truly believe that the way that we use the machine, uh, is, it is the way that we look at the world. So, you know, like I, then, then in so far as technique is important to that, but, uh, yeah. Okay. So this is the first picture in the book. Um, as you can see, just like uh, nor like just a lot, you know, half of it is just this kind of dead area, and then there's not even much going on above. Um, you know, one thing I would say that informs everything. You know, like we are form making creatures. Like as, even non artists, everyone, you know, walking around, we're just kind of there's all this chaos outside of us, right? We're just kind of like bringing it into some sort of semblance that that we as like an organism can use. We can walk through the world. We can, you know, make sense of it. And, um, but if, you know, a picture or a poem or something, you know, that is sort of a little bit of a formal distillation for me, you know, like um, my favorite poet, Wallace Stevens, he just called it a sudden lightness. And I've always loved that phrase. You know, it's like mm. for some moment, like something came into a lightness. And um, for us, I, as photographers, that's a formal lightness to me. It's a balance in the picture, uh, it's edges. It's all of these kind of things working together. So um, it doesn't have to be dramatic subject matter. It's more about like, it, do we have a balance here? Um, so the first picture, I'll maybe go through a couple. Uh, yeah, and um, maybe the second picture is just a, sort of a, a parking lot uh, and the uh, the slabs of the cement that lead toward the viewer uh, that you know would be where people would park. And I just you know it was just this form that kind of became a little sinuous here uh, against the, the poles. Um, and so, you know, these again, like I just, it's just, for me, it's just what Stevens would call the sudden right. It's like the world sort of makes sense for just, just a fleeting kind of moment. Um, and again, so uh, third picture, this, this picture um, is of uh, some various different kinds of wires that uh, most of them are sort of, uh, they're guide wires or holding wires for, for larger poles. Um, but this, this is where they're just sort of stuck in the ground. And, uh, you know, in my head, I'd say, well, the, like the world and the sky are sort of tethered together by all these wires, you know, that are uh, all kind of askew to one another. Um, and I, I like that idea. Um, let's go to and this, this whole series. This whole yeah. series was in uh, central Illinois, where you're from. Oh, well, this is all within, you know, walking distance. Actually. So uh, I good. should tell you, my is this a small town? Way. Yeah. Small town. Um, I do. My, one of my sisters lives outside of Pittsburgh though. And I think there's three or four pictures from there. Uh, in here, oh, so okay. um, yeah, you know, is that where you like to be? Oh, I love you know, that. there's a it, like one stoplight kind of place, you know. <laughs> like I said, you know, the more unremarkable on its own, probably the better for me. Um, Interesting. And, okay, I'm I'm going to do a little detour here because this is something that's also important for everything. Um, sure. My whole thing is that listen, we are not we are chaos inside. You know, we are these we are, there's. There's so much going on in our emotions and our thoughts and our feelings and what we've gained and lost in our lives. And the world is chaos outside, you know, and we're just constantly trying to trying to make, you know, bring that together, make some sense of that. And 
what I found, though, is, you know, not to travel to bunches of different places, but just like stick with one place now for many years, you know, like and, and literally within a few counties when we're driving around, but and even more generally, just a, like a walking distance, because if I can kind of calm down that chaos of the external a little bit, right? Um, I'm not looking at new subject matter all the time. In fact, I'm looking at the same stuff, but I'm seeing it over seasons. I'm seeing it as the light changes, as the clouds blow, you know, like all that kind of stuff. But what what it does, if I can calm that exterior variable down a little bit, it helps me look at the internal variables and see, you know, because this is the gist of photography for me is like, how do you bring what's inside you together with what's in the world using this machine that we have, this very peculiar kind of machine. And so I can start to think about, well, you know, a year ago, I this this person was in my life and now he or she is no longer and that's a loss. Or guess what? I've gained so much in this, you know, like I'm a different person now. And and not in that specificity, but like that all comes through, you know, like you're a different pic- picture maker than you were a year ago, than you were five years ago. You know, I, w- I will tell you, if I tried to make local object pictures again, I could not. Like, and I'm happy with that. Like, I'm just not seeing the world in the same way. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not that person anymore. And that, that feels good. Uh, you know, I don't regret that. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in relation to another project. But for example, okay. this picture that we're looking at now is just, um, it's a back, um, it's not a backboard, but it's the, the sensing behind a, um, before, where somebody throws a shot put and it's just to keep, you know, protect the crowd behind them. So, and, but it just has these very strange kind of undulations and how they built it. And, you know, if you stand at one exact place, this sort of creates this, um, you know, this pattern. And again, it's just like, it's pattern finding, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of things locking in and sort of making a little bit of sense. Uh, and then I'm going to do one last picture. This is the one, um, this is one of the most important pictures to me to, um, it's a picture of, it's, we're actually out in the middle of some farm fields but uh by a a rail line and um there are some rails sitting by the main rail line that are meant to be eventually switched out and put into the the line but they've been kind of left in a bit of a haphazard uh pattern um but you know then you'll kind of walk towards them and suddenly you know like at one moment the pattern sort of resolves and it makes and it kind of creates a, a sensible sort of formal thing for you and so again like just to go back to that it's a sudden rightness you know like it just felt like there's the moment where like me and the thing are locking together so um that you know and, and we you know you can see many more pictures in the book and see it on my website but this, this would kind of you know give you the, the i guess sort of the template or sort of the lay of the land for how you know a lot of the book um operates now the one thing i will tell you real quickly again we'll, i'll move forward is that it is sort of grounded in some in some um some two and three picture spreads, which stay, you know, which obviously these pictures were made within seconds of each other, because I did want to also sort of ground it in a, in a, in a, in a movement in the world and, and sort of a walking in the world so that it wasn't just a bunch of pictures, but that it really did, uh, you know, sort of ground itself in this, in this movement through the world. All right. So I'll stop. I think it's a fascinating, it's a, it's a fascinating project. I'm really enjoying uh, what I'm seeing so far. And, and you have a, another project that I thought was was quite interesting, and it, you're you're following the same type of um, aesthetic uh, throughout. Uh, you have these wide open spaces using um, Central Illinois uh, um, as as kind of your subject per se, exploring the same space. But this time, you're it seems like you're exploring time, and this was this series about Christmas. And uh, wrote a, I read a great review um, about it uh, once again on Urbanautica. And uh, uh, I want to kind of take, take a look through that and we'll jump into uh, uh, another project after that. And then we'll get into uh, uh, some, some of our later conversation. But sure. can you take me through what you were thinking about in that project? It, it had a, um, uh, what does Christmas mean to you at, at that time frame? What it, uh, where did this project come from and how did you put it together? Yeah. So actually Christmas itself has almost nothing to do with this. Uh, so um, <laughs> Like yeah, that. no, but it's a listen. No, it's a good question. Uh, so yeah, so this book is called Christmas Day, Bucks Pond Road. Um, this is the cover as you can see now, hopefully. Um, and it was all shot on one day. Um, I did not really? that morning, and yeah, I did not in, that morning intend to go out and make a book. Uh, and nor did I think that day, or even looking through contact sheets, or even a year later, that I had a book. Um, but 
yeah, it, it was all made on one day and it is made on this road. Um, so, okay. So here's another thing I, I'd like to talk about is like um, the way I talked about local objects and, you know, I may talk about this in, in relation to other projects. It's like, you know, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm trying to be objective about what I'm making, the subjective things I'm making as photographs and, and trying to, you know, this is an idea from Wallace Stevens. It's, you know, I, I kind of said this in a different way before, but every photograph is sort of a, you're plotting yourself against the world. You're finding some point between you and the world. And, um, and sometimes, you know, like you, sometimes you and the world seems like really close, right? And, you know, you, you feel good. And then sometimes the world seems really far apart and you feel really distant from the world. But that's okay because, you know, you write a poem, you make a picture, you do whatever, you, and you kind of, you're plotting those points between you and the world. And sometimes if, if things are cool, you, you're kind of in control of that a little bit, you know, like, and I would, I would say that like in Local Objects and some of the other books I made before uh, Bucks Pond Road, I felt like I was in control of that. I was like, okay, here's where I am in relation to the world. Um, this is an instance of, of a period of time maybe a year longer where I was not so in control of what of my picture making. And it felt very frustrating. And um, it was only, you know, this was, a, I, I wrote about this in the book. So like, it's certainly no secret or anything, but there was a, there was a person who had to leave my life. And I, um, I realized that too late that I didn't want, want him to leave my life. And so I felt like really sort of discombobulated. I was just really not in a, in a space where I was like connecting with the world very well. And so for, you know, like for a long period of time, I was making these pictures where I, I just was like, everything's off. Like the distances are off, the, the, the edges are off, the forms are off, like nothing made sense to me. But I was like, I don't know what else to do. I just got to keep burning film, right? Like I, that's all I can do. And so, um, so this walk and the, this set of pictures occurred during that time. And uh, so I'll, I'll start to walk you through. The cover has a picture, a very close up picture of uh, a tree that has um, been maimed, sort of, uh, it's still alive, uh, still living to this day, but uh, it's, uh, there's some wires close to it. So they have to come in every now and again, just like really just chop parts of it off so that the, the tree doesn't, you know, interfere with the wires. Um, but we'll, we'll move into it a little bit here. Uh, the, the book does start with a picture of um, sort of rubber, you know, on the road, uh, of, whether it was a peel out of a car or whether brakes have been hit really hard, you can see, you, you'll see where, um, you know, a car has either stopped or started. And basically I use that there because this is the, the only picture in the book I wanted there to be any noise in, uh, you know, quite a, quite a loud sound. And then uh, the book goes to its um, cover page, its title page. Is it like an image, and like a still image what, in a book can have a noise? This one does for me. Listen, no, you know, comparatively to the rest of the book. I mean, you know, when I say this, most people kind of do get that feeling of that whatever just happened, you know, and again, it didn't just happen. So the noise is in the past, you know, um, but interesting, you know, I, yeah, I listen, I may not go to the mat for that idea, but like, I mean, I think we can evoke it <laughs> a little bit, you know? Um, so, no, I agree with you. I was just, I wanted to pull it out. Yeah. Pictures are a little noisier, you know, or, or, yeah. or they have time sure. in them or whatever. And the rest of the book is really silent, uh, in in my opinion. Um, but after the, the title page, uh, we go to just a pretty simple picture of some of uh, some water, and uh, but it's kind of blocked. Like the the the, the tree um, that is in front of us is sort of blocking it, but the water comes all the right up. And I I talk and I talk a lot about my own pictures. I talk with students about edges and like you know like when a when a picture does or doesn't give you a firm place to stand. I think that's a really important thing. And, and this picture has water come all the way up to the bottom. You know, like, obviously I was on dry land, but like the picture is not necessarily. And so these are all the kinds of things I think about and, and work through. Next picture. And like, as I told you, and I'm, I'm, I, this does not make me uncomfortable. I'm glad to say this. It's hard to describe these pictures in much prose because it's, I would just keep saying trees, uh, you know, <laughs> over and over again and, and dead leaves. Right. There, and nothing is going to dramatic. Nothing dramatic is going to happen in prose language for this, you know, in general. Um, I'm on a third picture that, again, would not have any description uh, different from the, the previous one. Um, a little bit closer up, a little bit more depth of field in, this, in the next photograph. Um, 
Now, here, yes, at one the, the exact same time. This is this is winter time, so the trees do not yep. have leaves on them. Yep. Uh, it's it's clear that it's winter. Um, there's almost a frigidness to it. Um, yeah. Cold. Uh, a little bite as you walk down the street. Uh, you can almost feel it. Um, I've I been in uh, places like this, you know, and so I, um, when there's a bunch of leaves, it, it, you can almost feel the color, not in black and white, but it, sometimes you almost project it almost in the same way you project uh, sound. Uh, and, and so it's um, it, it gives me that feeling here. And, and it's going to lead me to my next question. I'm going to let you kind of yep. take, a, take us through a few more pictures. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, I, cause I do want to show you, like I did, you know, there, it's not just nothing because like, there's still like, I'm, it's important for me, the books to have things in them that are like, have a logic and have a, but the pic, the photograph we're looking at now, it's just, it, it's a relatively shallow, shallow depth of field, but there was a, a kind of a, a vine or some sort of plant that created like a V uh, image or V situation. And what I found then though, there was a picture that I made over the water in which there was a similar sort of elegant uh, v shape in a big in a much bigger branch. So um, right now I'm just I'm, I'm showing back and forth between them on the video, but like you can kind of see I'm looking for retrospectively I'm looking for sort of patterns and clues uh, in in the land. I'm going to move forward just to show you a couple of other ways that I did that um, because it's like I said it's important to me that there be um, so in this spread we we start to see a, a, a big kind of clump of trees off in the distance this was sort of my central thing because it just was like this big hulking mass and uh uh i was just interested in it and the book kind of comes closer to it as we as we get through some pictures kind of like faints away from it and then goes towards it um but it becomes a more important presence and you see I, you know i still take a, a fair amount of time to get there but um there were probably there were, uh, in, even in the final maquette, getting close to this, there were probably four or five of this this mass. We we got it down to maybe just two or three uh, as we get up closer to it. But it was sort of it sort of this picture became this was this is really the central picture. We're looking at a picture where it's just some foreground, and then um, sort of a copse of trees, um, half dead and half alive, but that um, are kind of just a big mass. And listen, you know, without getting like too metaphory, like I there, I was just. At this point in my life, you know, like there was these masses that sort of like were black holes. They were just sort of sucking in you know, the energy that I, that I had. And so this is a very awkward picture to me. And I, I you know, I wouldn't want to make pictures like this again, I, I, you know, I can say. Um, or I'm going to show you a picture later that I really, this, for me, the picture that we're looking at now, it's kind of a bit of slanted road, a slanted um, power uh, uh, pole and um, some trees. And like this picture is, it, for me, is a very... In general, it's a poor composition picture, but this is what what what, what I was doing then, and it became important to me now. Uh, and again, it's the kind of picture I don't make anymore, and I don't want to make anymore. But that's okay, because that that was in the past. Um, and I'll I'll stop sharing there because I just I'll tell you a little bit more. It's just like so the picture all made in one day. You know, I had and it's it's a set of contact sheets, but it's a set of contact sheets from a whole year. And I was now finally, you know, I moved emotionally out of that space i'm able to be a little bit more objective about all that stuff i'm looking at it i'm saying okay well maybe there's something to extract from this whole year's worth of contact sheets um that's i'm working on that looking at it looking at it you know and then i see you know i make some work prints and stuff and i look at that and i say well possibly the whole thing is is in that that day's wall right so so you know like because i do have students ask well how can you make a book in one day and it's like no i you know like it that, that the negatives happen to have been made in one day that's not the thing. Like I was a person who came to this situation from, you know, my whole life, you know, I was the person who made these pictures and I was the person who looked at them for two years, you know, like afterwards and like was just kind of looking and thinking about them. And I, that's what I extracted from this time of my life. That, that was the thing. And now the other thing is what that means is though, once I decided it, that I wanted to think of it as a book, there was no way to go back and reshoot any holes in it. I, a because to, not even to get the light right and all that kind of stuff, but B because I, how would I put myself back in that headspace? So I was like, yeah, well, either is a thing on its own, you know, or it isn't. And you know, and then so I made the Mac Cat and a lot of my friends, people said, hey, yeah, it's a thing. So you know, then then that's when we advanced it. But um, that's how you I know when I about. when I look at both of those series, especially, um, I feel like um, I'm finding thought. I'm feeling I'm feeling you think. 
and um, and kind of exploring uh, your thoughts through uh, the photograph. And uh, um, I keep going back to that uh, that title um, uh, in reference to Christmas because a lot of times uh, I know it's a tradition in the, in the United States. A lot of us, especially if we're transplants that are living in different parts of the country, we all come back for that one moment, you know, yeah. to the family, to groups, familiarity, and uh, we spend time with our family. And so, uh, did that play a role in in this series? Was that was that kind of involved, or or am I playing too much into this and reading too far? No, no. But you know, like, well, no, I don't think I. I definitely like that. That taps into it. Um, the the thing was is like I. The reason the title came about is like this was even the days. I think I made the eggs like in Tumblr days when I had a Tumblr and I put up one of them, you know, before I knew it was going to, before I, like, I thought it wasn't important, you know, or whatever you want to call it. And I just titled it Christmas day, comma, Bucks Pond Road. Cause that, that was, that was just the facts on the ground. Yeah. You know, like it wasn't meant to be like anything other than that. And then I was like, I was like, bump, bump, bump. Like, I was like, that has a nice little meter. Right. Yeah, and in fact, a poet friend of mine later, when we made the book, he's like, your poet, your title is a poem. The, the meter is just perfectly right. You know, like, and that was just luck. Um, but no, I mean, of course, there's these these things about, you know, like feeling connected or feeling disconnected on a holiday. Yeah. Uh, of course, you know, for, uh, for Americans and Thanksgiving is even worse for some Americans, you know, like, uh, or, yeah. you know, uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas is when we're supposed to be around the people we love. And when that's not the case, you know, like that's, that's, um, that's you know, a big deal. But but I did want it to be, listen, it, what it do, what it does, it says time and place, you know, and, and, but in an, hopefully like a slightly artful way, you know, um, and, and I like that, that it's sort of factual, but, but that has a poetry to it, you know? Uh, yeah. So if you could sum up that project with words, you know what I mean? And, uh, uh, yeah, and kind of sum up your, your mentality. Cause I'm trying to get into your brain there. I felt, uh, yeah, yeah. uh, a loneliness. I felt, uh, uh, a separateness. I uh, felt a contemplation there, and so I'm, I'm kind of curious to see what you would say um, and yeah. how you would describe that. Yeah, for sure. Because I know, and, and it's something. I'm glad you asked it because I, I kind of meant to say this, but like in other projects, I felt like I was sort of in control of the picture making, and this is the one. And it's, it's hard to call it a project because it was sort of retrospective. You know, like I, it, but this was a time when I was not in control of the picture making in a way that I was used to being, you know, like the, the, like I said, the world and me were not matching up and I was making pictures that just felt off and felt weird. Now I'm glad once I kind of got some distance from that, looking back on it and they, you know, I'm glad that I made the weird pictures. And so it was just a different exercise for me, you know, like knowing myself better, you know, like, and when you say, you know, yeah, it's about thinking and, and, and what I would even say it's about, more what I call like cognitive thought and not conscious thought, you know, like it's just, it's just this kind of moving around and like react, you know, like reacting and trying to make some, some sort of sense of things without even like getting to the level of narratizing it, you know, or, or, or owning it sort of narratively, um, you know, and then, then there were things like, here's a little like inside publishing thing is like, I showed the maquette to John Gossage and he, he was, he's like, great. And his one sort of, um, criticism is like he's just like i don't like left hand pictures alone uh without you know with blank light because it feels like you're looking back and i didn't tell them this at the time but like i i was like great because i am a protagonist in this book who is constantly second guessing himself who does not know his place in the world who's always looking back and thinking what did i mess up how what did i do wrong what could i've done better you know like and how did i get myself into this place where i can't make sense of things and it's just this you know, like the whole book, you, you kind of look at one thing, you spend three or four or five pictures on it and then you lose it. And then you go to another thing. And then, you know, that cops of trees that I mentioned, that was sort of the main thing you look at. Uh, we didn't get to the end of the book where there's a house where the protagonist sort of maybe sees something there, but then that disappears. And so, you know, I think this is, the, and I don't think I'm the only person who's ever experienced this, you know, after losing someone, you know, like we all just can't make sense of the world for a while. And, you know, but this was, this finally gave me a structural way to say like, man, I, I'm glomming onto this idea. That doesn't work. Glomming, you know, then I'll glom onto this idea. That doesn't work. You know, and it's just this constant sort of trying to move ahead, but second guessing yourself moving, you know, two, you know, the one step up, two steps back kind of cliche, you know, which 
is true. Uh, you know, you, you're just not doing what you want in the world. And so, like, I'm really glad how the book sort of enacts that, um, you know, that feeling. Um, anyway, long winded answer to your question. But uh, no, it's wonderful. It's uh, it's it's uh, a lot of what I connected to. And, and sometimes I uh, sometimes I do connect to to some photographs in in. But, you know, I, I learned a long time ago is once you put it out in the world, um, people are going to make of it, but they're going to make of it, yeah. you know, and and uh, and in a, in a lot of ways, it's it's uh, very nostalgic for me because I'm in a big city now and, and I look through that work and I used to do the same thing. I just walk around and especially on Christmas, just to get kind of get out of, yeah. get out of the house and away from uh, people and just spend some time with my camera and my thoughts and. And so I, I really related to that that project, and uh, it led me to. Um, I'm going to lead us to the to the next project. I think is. Uh, would you say this is more current? The 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 essay only kind of project that you have that that is uh, essays about photography. Yeah, well, it's really one long essay, but yeah, I mean one you know, long, and it uh, yeah, that's right. And um, well, yeah, I mean it's definitely because we all we released it just the tail end of last year. So it's still, and you know, we're really a lot of the sort of promo and, uh, you know, like talking to people is really, that's where a lot of the energy is for me and the ice plant right now, for sure. I think that project is, is really interesting. And there's a few spots in, and, um, uh, I, I don't have the book yet, so I'm actually grabbing the, these, um, from on, uh, on, online. But, uh, I, one of the things that I really liked is that you didn't, uh, do this in a very, traditional way it's not right. when you read through this it's not structured and formatted um like any other book it's almost like uh, musings in a, in a lot of ways um, right. i read a lot of philosophy and uh and uh, i read uh, marcus aurelius's meditations and it's kind of these little moments and and it kind of had that feeling to it would you agree or no oh yeah yeah it's okay, um, okay. yeah and I actually have a PDF. I can show you know show people a little bit of the structure. Yeah, that you're talking please. About. Um, yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. I love the different colored text. I love how some is indented. You have some. Uh, it's it's really really interesting. Um, when you did this project, what were you thinking about? Uh, why did you feel like this was the time to do it? I had been writing essays uh, for for TIS Books website, and then. I got to tell you, it's the, the interesting thing is if you write just a few things in the photography world, you'll get asked to write more. Uh, they really like um, Camera Club of New York, kind of they actually, I, you know, they paid a little bit for me to write, you know, blog posts for three months. And then uh, Houston Center of Photography asked me to write something and uh, Aperture. Like I wrote Stanley Wolanka Wanamba uh, was the editor, guest editor of one of the photo book reviews. And he asked me to write a review of Michael Schmeling. And um, I wrote for Richard Rothman um, for the Light Work Annual. And then like I wrote, uh, for Mary Fry for her book. And so I just, just wrote for Nathan Pierce for his first monograph. So, uh, I love it. You know, like it's gotten into me. And then like, I, I this, my ideas have been kind of floating around and I was like, well, I think I got something longer form in me. Um, now what happened though, is like, this was, well, this was tail into 2019 and I sort of wrote what became the introduction and I had a, a basic outline and I was with the ice plant in um in paris and like in milan and and some other places doing some promo for uh, like the, the events for um bucks pond road and so i kind of said so mike slack who's uh, um along with trisha gabriel is the ice plant he is also a writer so i kind of pitched it to him to be my editor you know while we were on trains and planes and and stuff and uh he's like yeah i think you know let's let's try this and none of us expected the world to shut down you know five months later and i thought it was going to take three or four years to write but you know i'm still fully employed uh during lockdown but then suddenly i you know had all this extra time and so i kind of plowed through it and did it um but i so i will show a few so that's the cover everybody's looking at um there are lots of sort of the that starts out with a what, what we call the preamble which is the introduction which you know it looks relatively straightforward and that is the most straightforward part of the book but um what Patrick was referring to is that then from then on, we go to sort of a, a style where there's two colors. There's sort of this blue green and there's orange uh, in these two pick in the two uh, things I'm showing now. Um, this happened because in a strangely organic way, because I, as I, I, you know, I built an outline for the book. So I knew roughly where everything was going to happen. Um, 
But as I started to build it in, I just, you know, as, as you would with an outline, you just keep putting, you tuck something, oh, you're like, oh, here's an idea, here's where it needs to get tucked in. So I'm just, you know, doing that over and over, putting ideas in. Sometimes I put a quote that I think, oh, I'm going to, this is where I want to use that quote. Oh, here's another idea, you know, like, let's t- tuck that in there and all this kind of stuff. And suddenly, this outline, I was looking at it and I was like, well, if I just make these more into sentences, that suddenly, I called it a narrative outline. And that's, that's basically how it happened. Uh, it, we just, I started doing this. Um, now the one thing though, I, you know, I'm going off doing all this and, you know, I was just using the indents and like word and all, some of my friends, I showed it to, they're like, I think I'm getting this, but I'm not sure. You know, they, they were, they were like, I don't know, but I gave it to Mike Slack and somehow that guy, he, he saw through it. He saw it, he understood it. And he's like, well, I'm going to just, I'm going to do some color here. I'm going to do this. And he did like a little quick layout. And suddenly, like, uh, it made sense. And so what I'll tell everybody is that, um, and this, this is described in the, in the beginning of the book, there's actually this thing called about the text. It's sort of a how to use it. But um, the blue are what most people would be called, like, standard footnotes or endnotes. Um, but they're, they're kind of discursive essays on their own. Or they're not discursive. They're, they, they're discursion sort of diversions. Um, they're little, es- sometimes mini essays. They kind of go off on their own. Uh, and then the, what's in the more like the orange is uh, direct quote uh, from other sources, which I use uh, pretty frequently. So I'll show you um, if you're on the video, you'll see the first few pages in the book. So um, we we sort of tell everybody in that little intro section, you know, if you just want to stay with all the black type, uh, you, you can read that through and, you, you know, you'll 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 understand the book or if you'd like to kind of take the slow road. And, you know, just keep going through, you know, go black and then go to the diversion of the the, uh, the the blue teal or, you know, however you want to do it. You can jump around like that. And uh, but, you know, like it, it was just meant to show, you know, like as it became came kind of obvious that. And and Mike was sort of it was good because like Mike was my therapist, like he was looking back and he's like, well, this is the way you're you sort of organize your brain. And I was like, I know, you know, it's jumping all over. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of, you know, footnoting and then going back and like, yeah. um, and so this was a way to also give form um, to, you know, to what I was doing. And, you know, and there was some constructive criticism early on, again, when it wasn't this well kind of laid out. And I, I there, there were many more quotes because, you know, I, I kind of, as everyone does, you kind of overwrite a book to bring it back. And um, so there were lots of quotes and some people would say, well, I'd like to know what you think. And I was like, yeah, but man this is what I think or more, more specifically, it's how I think like um, I would love to be a guy who came up with, with brilliant ideas, just like out of the blue, you know, like, but I'm not like, I'm a guy who reads constantly and I'm a magpie. Like, you know, like I'll yank in whatever I need from, um, from what I'm reading, from what I'm, you know, music, I'm uh, from, you know, movies. Like I just yank it. I want to yank it in and I make this, I'm, you know, that's how I kind of create myself. And, and so this book, you know, uh, Foucault, I think, talks about this and the uh-huh. death of the author. Um, he, he says something along this lines is that we're a culmination of uh, influences and experiences yeah. and none of our ideas are original. And so, right. uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and so it's it, I think that is a, a great way to uh, put that in there. Um, so keep going. I, I yeah, you, no. you just got me thinking about that because that's so true. Yeah. Um, you know, and one of my friends paid a very nice compliment to me. He's like, you, for some reason, you look at other things and see how they relate to photography. You know, like, and I was like, yeah, like, yeah. you know, suddenly when 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 Marilyn Robinson or Flannery O'Connor talk about writing, you know, uh, I was like, oh yeah, I, I that can be useful, you know, to to us. And I, you know, like I I um, for some reason, you know, like except in a little, you know, some of the writings of Adams and Shore, like I just think that for other art forms are more. Like, I think photography is well served by the sort of uh, semiotic, you know, linguistic analysis. I mean, that's been, you know, the, the, the trend of the last 20, 30 years. But but it's less well served by the um, coming from the aspect of the maker, uh, it, it, you know, with the, with some exceptions like Wright Morris as well. You know, some other um, people who've written about it. But like um, from the from coming from a person who wants to make photographs and and. Uh, you know, how, how do, how do writers constructing, how does Marilyn Robinson get a hold of character? You know, how does Flannery O'Connor deal with what she called grace? Like, how do you turn grace into a short story? You know, like 
that's like that's what really interests me because I want to know how do I turn these things inside of me into photographs. You know, like how do how do I use my machine, which you know, and I figure out how you use this thing uh, moving through the world. How can I how can I get at what I want to get at? So anyway, I'll stop sharing that because you, that's pretty exemplary of the whole rest of the book. Uh, the way so it's structured. you you. It- one of the uh, one of the reviews on it was is you're making an argument uh, for the comparison of death and photography, and if you could sum that up without giving away the book, because I want people to go and buy that book, um, yeah, it, te- tease me a little bit with what what kind of ideas you're exploring. Yeah, so I, that that's a little finer point than I would put on it, but it, but still relates. So like I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm not so much relating photography with death per se. I'm limit. I'm I'm talking about limitations. And then one could say death is the ultimate limitation for all of us. You know, the, 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 our, our, no, listen, our finitude is our ultimate limitation. Um, so, so of course that's related. And I use the word, my title, you know, coming from um, Montaigne, but, but the, the real, and I don't mind giving away the gist of the book. I, I you know, like, uh, because, <laughs> you know, like, listen, I, I want people to buy I, it. Come on. <laughs> I, you, I, uh, I listen, I want people to buy it too. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite stories though, it's Flannery O'Connor is reading a good man is hard to find to a writing class. And before she reads it, I, and I'm not going to, I don't want to give anything away. Sorry. I won't give us no spoiler alert here. There's a horrific ending to this short story. Every I've read it 10 times. And if I read it at night, like I'm, I'm like under the covers terrified anyway there's a horrific yeah. ending to the story she told it to them before she read the story she's like because i don't want you to get hung up on the plot the plot the that that's not the thing we're gonna you know the the my, my short story is not the plot so anyway i don't mind giving it away um but the deal is is like you know what i've been talking about you know as, as we move through the world with this unusual machine that we have you know like and that's different from how every other artist works. You know, like uh, we are limited by time and by the actual, right? And the, the photograph is actually made of time, even if it's a 250th or a 500th, you know, it's made of time. But also, again, we're not talking Wall and Gursky and anything else here. We're talking, you know, the kind of pictures we make is that you're bound by the world you're moving through. You know, like uh, you can't just move a tree if it's not amenable to the picture. You got to move your feet. You know, you you have to interact with this world you you can't you know again digital whatever you can do that later but but really the poet the painter you know the musician they are not bound in the ways that we are and i think that's super interesting and you know i'm writing another book already and like i i didn't use this phrase in this book but i should have and maybe i should have but now i do is like almost you know consciousness language all of these other things they're what most philosophers would call transcendence right that is we can transcend the moment the painter can transcend the moment the poet can for sure all of these people photography is the art of imminence it it is stuck it is it is tied it is bound to now and here you know just like your body is and um your brain can go off and tell yourself great stories about being in paris next fall and your vacation and your grandmother back at you know making cookies you know 30 40 years ago your body can't do that your body is stuck here and now, and the camera is stuck here and now. And I find this very fascinating. And I think that, it, you know, if you can make your peace with making photographs, you're sort of finding a way to make peace with the, the mortal limitations that we have, our finitude and our, our you know, Heidegger would have called it our, um, our thrownness, right, into the world. Like, we are thrown into the situation. That's part of us. And uh, I think my, my supposition is that the camera is the most closely tied to the way that we are thrown into the world. And that's, that's a, you know, a lot of what the book is about. And, and that we can find peace, we can find some sort of uh, fruitful or fortuitous sort of way to work once we sort of accept that. You know, that's such a, uh, you know, just to even think about what you're saying there is, 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 uh, it's, it's profound. And I think uh, if you were to read this book, you, you're going to be contemplating uh these ideas and i think it's important you know it when you start to get really good at photography you start to kind of realize that limitation for sure and uh you what i loved about it and especially with film and i was going to ask you about film um is unlike a digital camera you're you're shooting a thousand images and you can kind of shoot until you get it right but 
with a film camera, it's limited in the sense that you have 12 shots, you have a limited amount of uh, film that you can shoot on. And so it almost forces you to be where your feet are. It's And it's one of my favorite things about photography is it makes you be here right now and confront yeah. your 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 moment. And uh, I, I think you uh, you're nailing it um, as far as that that conversation. And it, it actually feels very relevant uh, to to now. I think uh, these contemplations, I think when I when it kind of shoots back to the origins of, of the forming of this podcast and this will kick us off and we'll finish off the show um, with this conversation is uh, what do you think uh, in today's age when everyone has a camera, we're surrounded by thousands of images. We're, we're being confronted constantly with images um, what do you think, uh, people are, you know, you, you work with students today. What do you think people are, are dealing with? Um, especially when they make images, what do you think, uh, is one of the yeah. biggest factors that's affecting image makers today? You know, well, we probably should divide that question because listen, I, I think there are grave societal challenges with photography in general. Um, I mean, what we can believe from the New York times homepage and what we can believe on CNN. I mean, I think we, those are things societal and uh, I don't know, you know, like I really don't know. Um, and I'm worried, you know, like um, I'm worried for, you know, how people think about what, you know, how we make decisions and how we move forward politically and all this kind of stuff with not knowing what's, what's accurate and what's not. Now that's one thing to say. And what, you know, one could spend a lot of time talking about that. And I do with my friends, but like, I'm also, I'm in the world, let's call it in quote photography. That's, you know, I, I teach, you know, photo book and, and, and there I am much more relaxed. I have to tell you, like, first of all, I've never thought of any ob art object as telling me any sort of truth now, about the world. Right. I hope no one's ever disappointed to learn that Matisse's, the walls of his studio were not painted red. Um, you know, they weren't. Um, and I don't know that anyone would ever read to the lighthouse to get like sociographic or ethnographic information about like rich British people spending a summer in Scotland. Like for me, art, like the, the, the subject, the veracity of the subject matter has never been the point of art for me. Um, so I'm not worried. I have to tell you about that. You know, like, um, some people, you know, like they make it a big deal. Like they're like, well, you know, Ache's exposures were so long that some of those streets weren't empty but they just didn't register on the film. I was like, so like I, did I ever like expect that, like that, 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 that was, you know, like I wasn't looking to that for absolute factual information. I, I was looking to that to see how that human being placed himself against the world. And I'm, and I read to the lighthouse multiple times to find out how Virginia Woolf is one of the best at getting at what is it like to be a conscious cognitive creature, you know, and with, with all these inputs going through you and, and, you know, she calls it the, the, the best line. And there's, you know, the very jar on the nerves, you know, like, it's like, what are we before we like made, no, made stories out of all? What are we just as experiencing things? Like that's like the story is also, it's damn good, but like, who cares? Like, you know, like uh, if, if your achievement is to talk about a cognitive creature in the world, then that's where Virginia Woolf exceeds. You know, that that's what I think. So anyway, long winded way of saying the velocity, the, the, indexical veracity of the of the photograph to the world has never been a concern of mine what i what is a concern is that uh one is using the machine properly to to uh to connect with the world and to speak truthfully of one's interaction with the world and so one's interaction with the world is way different than the world you know um and i just it, for me the context of art is not where i'm seeking those ideas now totally also legitimate for other people to want art to do that and I'm not making an argument that one shouldn't i just mean that that i don't uh, you know that's not my register for how for how i'm thinking about this so i get big answer grave concern for photography and for society smaller answer for art i think this is just always where everybody has been you know is that it, it uh, is to know that i mean you know basically i also i'm a good post-structuralist i believe that words never truly of the world you know we can't we can't really talk correctly about what's out there you know and to think that we can make pictures correctly about what's out there is just you know that 
kind of a pool there and at in some point for me. So anyway, I've talked a lot. Um, I'd love to hear your question. <laughs> so. No, I, I, it makes me think, do you think you can trust photography? Can you trust a photograph? So yeah, again, Today. I would, I, uh, in the bigger context of like, I still hope the New York Times and CNN are doing, and you know, they, they actually right now, we have not independently verified this photograph, this video, like they're trying, but I, I think that's your, your main question is as a society, can we trust them? Probably the answer is no. And we got to figure out, we got to figure out how that's going to go. The question though, is the interesting question in, if I'm looking at an, an art photography, am I looking at a photo book? Then I would say, well, do I trust that this is getting at a, a, an experience that I think is, is genuine? Or, you know, because, you know, listen, a lot of art photographers are now are um, in this world are much more famous for sort of like stylistic tricks and, some, you know, like, um, you know, or creating worlds, for example, um, you know, cre creating whole tableaus to, to photograph, you know, and, and things like that. Um, that's If there's a truth in that, it's a different kind of truth. Then, then, um, because I getting back to what I was talking about in the world and like moving through the world in a certain way, um, also, like, I'll even back up a little bit and say, you know, like, I'm also a true Nietzschean and I don't think I never would use and use the word truth. Like, there's no truth about the world, there's there's things that are useful about the world. Uh, you know, it's it, it, you know, it's good to believe that you should lift your foot in front of that curb or you're going to trip. You know, that's not that's not yeah. true, but it's it's damn useful. You know, like, um, so, yeah. uh, you know, and, and, it, you know, yeah, Joe Biden is the president that, you know, whether you call that true, it's, it's useful information. It's what we rely on. It's how we, the world is going to work, you know? So, um, so I guess my, I'm just saying my expectations, um, and the, just the register, you know, that the, the tone that I, I, I'm in for art is just different from, from journalism or from, you know, politics and and some other things and i know for many other my friends I don't they they don't wall them off those things off as, as much as i do and i totally respect that you know like for other people it's a, a maybe much more permeable sort of barrier it, it seems as um uh in this time you know photography when it first came out it was it was looked as like this truth barometer for yeah. truth right. and um you know you, as you see throughout the eras, uh, as as you go through time, um, you have this argument that that photography is art, and um, and now more than ever, it's 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 obvious that it is, and and the reason is is because I I have found that uh, photographs are not necessarily about facts per se; it's about feeling. It, it makes the way it makes you feel, and that's where the truth lies. How does it make you feel? And I and I think right now when you're inundated with images these days uh it's it, they're making you feel a certain way about certain things and, and that may inspire you to buy things it may mm -hmm. inspire you to protest it may inspire you to do all types of things but we've got to know that this is this is happening to us and this is where a lot of our uh, conversations with me and steve actually uh, mm -hmm. um, uh kind of originate you know, as image makers, as people that go to art school, we learn visual language. Not only that, uh, going through history and seeing how people use images. Um, what What is your advice for someone that hasn't gone through art school and is not making with images? Uh, how could you like, what, what would you tell someone if they were trying to make sense of our image culture right now? What would you say? Wow. Uh... I know it's a tough one, it's but yeah. it's the reason why this show exists is to kind of unpack this for for our average user, average viewer, you know, and, and try to make sense of it. Yeah. Well, listen, you know, like I think this is not an area of expertise for me, but I do read into, well, and it probably is a lot of it's Marxist generated thought, you know, it's like to say... When you know, you know, like, and a lot of it, boy, when they analyze a picture, suddenly it can get really crazy and like almost silly. But I think the baseline argument, you know, is that, look, a photograph in the world, you know, wherever, you know, it, it may be serving someone's interests that you don't know who they are. You know, you don't know what those interests are. Like, and you know, like, I, the, the, I think the interesting part of Marxist critique is that if, 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 so, if one wants to say that, like, because we think pictures are factual, that sort of naturalizes the ideology in the picture. Like, I'm, 
this, that's not my in- area of interest, but I, I, that sounds, that sounds, def- you know, intellectually defensible to me. That sounds like, yes, okay, we probably overbelieve pictures because of the, uh, we overbelieve photographs because of we, the nature of their making. Uh, so somebody can easily doctor up a picture of some geopolitical situation. And I, you know, if I just got it immediately and I would be like, oh, guess that happened. And now I think that we all must be probably not write an Instagram post 10 seconds after you see an image, like probably hold off, you know, like I, it, so that is my piece of advice. And so I, I was talking with some friends over beers last night that hold your fire. I guess I would, that's my blanket advice is hold your fire because you're going to see a lot of stuff that's just not correct, you know, yeah. uh, not factually correct. And if you go ahead and post, on your social medias and you start yelling about things before you even know really what the thing was. This is what's causing a lot of problems for a lot of people right now. You know, it's like, calm down for a second. Like, does the photograph come from a reliable source? Does, you know, does it look right? Mm-hmm. You know, all these kind of things. Like, so that is my advice is like, take a breather, you know, think about things, like make sure that, you know, like that, you know, that you really know what's going on. Uh, as far as the veracity of that photograph, it's sourced, it, you know, it's making all that kind of stuff. Now, also just what I said, maybe a task that's too big for most people, including me. I don't mean that, you know, like, do I need New York Times? Do I need CNN? Do I need the Washington Post? Whoever, do they need to have some sort of vetting systems where we can, where we be like, okay, this photograph is real, you know, like, or whatever. I don't know. Like, this is way beyond my pay grade as far as this kind of stuff goes, but, um, yeah, I think it's a it's an interesting conversation now, especially um, um, with AI. Uh, that that was my yeah. thesis research, and uh, one of the images that was circling around was uh, Macron getting uh, arrested. Um, yeah, during the uh, uh, during the uh, the protest here in Paris, and uh, it was so realistic, and it was just making the rounds. And and if you were just to look at that and didn't understand the aesthetic of AI, you would have believed that that was actually sure. happening. And and I think what's interesting is um, looking at artists like you, um, looking at the way you think about uh, images, the way you place images in series, the way you um, jumping into conversations like this right now can can be very 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 helpful for people. Um, uh, is there anything else you want to add to this conversation? I think it's a it's an interesting one. It's it's good. It's it's my it's my research as of right now is how to make right. sense of this world. Um, anything else that you would add about this, especially since you work with students all the time? No, well, no, you know, again, and I really, I'm listen. This last five minutes is super, super interesting, and I do think about it. But I part of me also says, but I don't know enough, and so like I, I want to keep myself yeah. limited, you know, like um, so, and I think this stuff is moving so fast, and like it's just not the area that I keep, that I pay attention to as much as other areas, um, so you know, there's always just that, you know, like um, take what I say with a grain of salt too, but but you know, the thing is, again, it's a bit insulated because all, you know, my students are not, by the way, they're not high school and college, the, the and many of them already have MFAs, so because I teach in a year long. Uh, photo book course through the Penumbra Foundation here in New York and I do some mentoring and stuff so almost everybody's like accomplished and they're just trying to get a project done or you know get through it so they are all the combination of age you know they're they're a little bit ahead you know they're not susceptible maybe to to a lot of this stuff Um, but also they're just they're working in an art place where they're they're our conversations just are not so much on this you know we're we're trying to just put a fine point on a book and, and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, I'm a little bit insulated from, from that, but, but, you know, I think, you know, just it, it's still part of the overall question is like, well, what can we believe or not believe from a, this particular kind of picture called a photograph and what burdens are we putting on it? And um, that, you know, that I'm super interested in. And, and I think that has ramifications for, for art photographs, you know, so. Well, and I think, it, you know, as an art photographer, someone that has an MFA, I think the the image itself is something that I'm constantly trying to use to communicate an idea to you. I'm thinking mm-hmm. out loud on an image and I'm yeah. using images in a way to kind of convey uh, my point of view. And mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, I feel like a lot of us have, um, you know, a little piece of the puzzle. Um, and uh, 
yeah. uh, through our own practices. Uh, we're using images, whether consciously or unconsciously, uh, um, in a way that uh, is communicating. And I think by, you know, kind of diving into image makers per se, and even people that interpret images like curators and people that put together books and, and stuff like that, there's there's little pieces of, of genius. And I know you say you're insulated, but you in, in a lot of ways, you're helping people put their set of images out into the world of images. Yeah. And uh, so we're constantly uh, participating in this ecosystem. And, and I think it's interesting because a lot of us are, are doing it in really profound and powerful ways. Yeah. And uh, I, I loved your insight today. And uh, we'll go ahead and close it right there. Um, sure. But uh, the last little bit is uh, tell us how we can interact with you. Uh, are you on social media or, or websites? Or uh, go ahead and share those right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm on Instagram. Uh, it's just Tim Carpenter. Um, so I got that. I'm on Facebook. Uh, I, I don't do as much there, uh, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still on there. Uh, and the website is Tim Carpenter Photography uh, dot com. Um, so, yeah, you can find me at any of those places. Um, and like I said, so every photograph from everything I've published is on my website. Uh, if you know, if you're interested and you want to go more slowly through them or anything, if you were on the audio and um, anything I described. So it's all there. Where could we find the book? Oh, yeah. So uh the book is available in most, we are now in European countries uh, pretty well, uh, not so well in Asia yet. We're still working on this. I got to tell you, getting stuff from, you know, around the world now is a very, very complicated situation. Um, but you can go, almost all the local have it, uh, even though I hate Amazon and I, I, I'm sorry to be uh, pump, pumping Amazon. It's one of the best solutions for Europeans. Um, but then also some photo specialist bookstores like Me Camera and Milan, uh, Bildband in Berlin. So if you're, if so maybe it's one of, oh, it's the Tanta books in UK. It would be like three, depending on where you are, you could probably order it from one of them and not have the shipping be gigantic. If, uh, yeah, if, it, if you don't have it in a local store. And perfect. Thank you so much uh, for your your time today and and sharing your insights and sharing your work. I, I really appreciate your time. It was uh, it meant a lot uh, to me and and I and I really enjoyed uh, the last part of the conversation. I I have a lot that I will take uh, from that. So I just really want to say thank you. Listen, it's been my pleasure. It's very interesting and like like I told you at the beginning, anything for Steve and Urbanautica and you. Like I uh, you guys. Do- uh, it's a it's a mutually beneficial uh, uh, relationship and partnership, and I'm I'm glad to you know keep it going. All right, well, thank you so much. And uh, if you like this content, uh, and uh, please like, share, subscribe to our channels, as well as uh, uh, contribute to our Patreon. Uh, our, our Patreon is the way that we're actually supporting po- uh, podcasts like this. And thank you so much, and we'll see you next. Time.